So are microservices dead? Maybe not, but there's some challenges to overcome. Let's talk about it. So welcome back to the Cloud Computing Insider Show. My name is Dave Linthick. I'm author, speaker, Beelis Geek, and here to talk to you about the realities of cloud computing and how to make it work for your enterprise. Well, first, thank you very much again for uh, bringing me past 100,000 subscribers. I'm at about 110,000 subscribers now, and uh, it's growing quickly. So thank you very much for the encouragement. I'll keep putting out this content if you guys keep listening to it and uh, putting comments below and letting me know the topics you want me to cover. Again, I think this is a need in the uh, industry right now, someone who's able to talk about the good and the bad aspects of cloud computing, regardless of whether or not it goes against the market narrative. Well, this one was a, a, a little, um, took some thinking before I uh, covered this particular topic and uh, actually submitted it as an article uh, for another publication. And they were concerned about, you know, it being a bit uh, of a touchy subject for many, uh, many places, but it really shouldn't be. At the end of the day, architecture has become purpose built for whatever kind of problem you're looking to solve. And there is no one architecture over the other. It's going to be the it depends thing. It depends on what you're doing in terms of what architecture should be applied, what technology should be applied to solve your particular problems. And really, this is no different. And what we're talking about here is the rise of micro, microservices and the ability to use very fine-grained services uh, versus more of a monolithic architecture where we're binding things together. So it's really building something that's going to be a bit more complex and distributed where you're pushing the functionality or pushing the behaviors out into very small services that are operate that are able to operate independently uh, of each other, and you're able to call upon in whatever sequence you need to call upon them. And obviously, there's some benefits in doing that. And we'll get into that uh, below uh, in terms of reusability. Uh, but this really became more of a trend than anything else. Uh, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, people decided that microservices were the best way to take things. We had service-oriented architecture, by the way, which has been around since uh, the, just after uh, 2001, best I can remember. And that was focusing on the ability to decompose applications of set, as sets of services that are able to be configured and reused any number of ways. Uh, and so microservices really kind of an offshoot of that. They're, at the end of the day, they're very fine-grained services, microservices, small services that do very distinct and narrow things. And in doing that, we're able to create a collection of these services that are able to work together to form the application. And so it seemed like a very uh, elegant way uh, to build applications, an architectural approach to make it happen. There are books written about it. Um, I've written about it a few times in different, uh, different articles, uh, used it in projects. And now, in 2024, 2025, we're looking at some of the trade-offs that we're finding in using microservices and looking at the reality of the benefits and also the deficits that microservices bring. Uh, so let's talk about that. So I'm not going to get too much in the weeds on software architectures, um, event-driven architectures. There's different uh, architectures out there we've been using over the years, and software engineers and software architects will use different architectures that they feel is appropriate to address the problems that they're looking to solve, in this case, using software. At this time, we're talking about the differences between two types of architectures. One is monolithic, and the other is a microservices architecture. Simply put, monolithic architectures are used uh, used in the process of creating applications where all of the components are built, uh, all of the components to build applications become a single unit. So in other words, everything is coupled together, the database, the behavior, uh, user interface, and we're putting everything into the same application space. So it's basically the way we used to build applications. And so, you know, if you built an application 30 years ago, there was never a thought in terms of distributing it and breaking it down as a series of services, which is really what microservices are. We built them as a monolithic infrastructure, and there's reasons why we did that. It was fairly simple, easy to understand, easy to build. All the tools supported it, and so monolithic kind of ruled the roost. You know, and then microservices came along, and a microservice architecture offers significant benefits, and these include modularity. So in other words, we're able to break everything down as a series of microservices, small services. 
allowing easier development and maintenance and services handle specific functions. So we will have a microservice that does nothing but do a uh, check to see if a social security number is valid. Uh, maybe not even valid and looking it up in a database, but valid in terms of its format. So it's something very narrow and very specific. And so that's why we leverage them. So, and they're able to enable independent scaling uh, because we're able to leverage services uh, independently. And the services are basically little, little micro applications that are operated unto themselves. And so if we're doing that, uh, we can deploy services without affecting the entire application. So there's lots of benefits in isolating particular behaviors in particular small services being microservices. You know, teams can choose different technology stacks for each service. You don't have to build the stacks in a particular programming language, the same programming language. You can pick different tools and technologies. Since we have common mechanisms to communicate with these services, such as web services, uh, that capability exists. So you can build a service without understanding its potential use. In other words, you're building a service for a generic use versus a specific application. And the, uh, these architectures align with our, the whole DevOps stuff and Agile stuff, continuous integration, continuous uh, development and deployment. They speed up deployment and reduce downtime. At least that was the, the sell at the time. And they were promoted as providing more organi organizational agility because, again, we're able to build things as components and not necessarily always within the same application domain. And therefore, they can provide faster time to market, more efficient development of their complex applications. And so they had lots of benefits that people were pushing into the marketplace in terms of what microservices are able to do. And I even remember the time you know, going through that and having many discussions in terms of the significance of the utilization of microservices architectures. And so that got us to where, kind of where we are today. So again, the advantages of using microservices and the hype around it um, was something to behold. You know, suddenly everybody was going to conferences to use how to, to learn how to build things using microservices. Different tooling was, was, was uh, created to leverage microservices. They were a core part of container-based development, Kubernetes-based systems. All these things were based on building microservice stuff. And so the advantages are they're modular. They allow for specialized functions and independent updates. And again, we can put the uh, changes that need to occur into a particular domain, in this case, a service. They provide scalability, and they permit individual services to grow and change, again, without impacting others. So if they're well-architected, I should be able to change that service as needed. For example, our social security example I just gave up, uh, and we maybe change that to a different format and say the... Uh, this isn't going to happen. Say the U.S. goes to a 20-digit uh, social security format. Uh, and therefore, I only make the change in a single service. And that service, since it's automatically leveraged by any number of applications, will take those changes. And I don't have to go to each individual application and change each application. I could just change it one time within a particular small, uh, narrow uh, use service, which is going to be used in any number of places. But the challenges of microservices, and that's really kind of the core focus of this video, is what those are and the reason why people, people may be moving or organizations may be moving away from microservices these days. Increased complexity in service orchestration and management. So in other words, if you're building a microservice-based system, you're building an application based on hundreds, sometimes thousands of services, that's going to be a complex beast. And it's going to be very tough to keep, that, keep track of that. And even if you're reusing the services, that's still something that's going to have many different dependencies, many different moving parts. And building a microservices-based application is simply going to take longer. It's going to take more talent. You have to have architectural understanding of how you're going to leverage the tools, different testing environments, you know, different uh, CI/CD pipeline environments. It's, it's just different. More stuff has to occur. It's going to cost you more to build. So... The uh, high cost is there in terms of the numerous small services and inter-service communications uh, that are occurring. So all these services are running. We have to maintain them. And all these services are communicating one to another, and therefore we're facilitating communication between them, sometimes within the same platform, which typically isn't much of a problem, but in many cases over networks, uh, networks in clouds, networks on, on premise, premises, uh, in between a hybrid environment on on prem via cloud and all these sorts of things, where we have this bunch of stuff communicating one to another, 
and these very complex services that are communicating in very complex ways. So we can find some issues there. Um, there are high operational costs, typically, uh, frequent state transitions and data handling that occurs within uh, microservices versus monolithic architectures, scalability limits, uh, restricted system growth and potentials. In other words, we may not be able to scale those as, as quickly and as, as uh, efficiently as we should. And we're just finding that there are some cool stuff in terms of microservices and definitely some architectural advantages. And it just seems logically uh, like a good idea. Um, but there's a number of downsides that are starting to occur as well. And then people are questioning the use of microservices. And I think they should. I think it's OK to question something that we thought was a good idea for a long period of time. If we're running into data and we're running into results that are providing the, op the facts that microservices are not going to be right for every application out there and we should use them sparingly. Let's figure out why. So what happened is a number of organizations out there um, found that when they took microservice-based systems and they converted them into a monolithic-based system, in other words, taking these very complex service-oriented applications and combining them into a single uh, unified group of things, in other words, having the user interface and all the services that exist in a single application space versus out into services, bind that directly with the data, run the data in the same space, the user interface in the same space. In essence, taking something that was very complex, combining it and make it very simplistic, that they had some advantages uh, that started to emerge that they started to write and speak about. So this eliminated in, uh, external dependencies and simplifying orchestration because there wasn't going to be orchestration. These services didn't have to communicate one to another because the services existed in the same application. So keep that in mind. So Lots of organizations that went from running microservice-based systems to using monolithic-based architectures, either converting something from a, uh, a microservice-based architecture into a monolithic architecture, and then noting the benefits there, started to see their significant upside to not using microservice architectures for the same application problems that they're trying to solve. So they're able to achieve 90% reduction in operational costs in many instances. So they reported the fact that, okay, we built this thing using microservices. We moved it into a monolithic architecture. We were getting a cloud bill in some organizations that are, you know, uh, streaming services were, were reporting this. It was, a, say, a million dollars a month. And we got down to $100,000 a month just by leveraging a different architecture and leveraging those services in a different way. And this enhanced system scalability, performance. And so they're able to get to a much more optimized operational state uh, because the utilization of a monolithic architecture versus microservices gave them a tremendous advantage. And I think what happened is no one ever you know, really kind of asked the question, is microservices the right way to go? And, and I used to sit in meetings all the time where uh, they would say automatically, yeah, we'll, we'll just use, you know, use our microservices architecture to solve that issue. And my question was, sometimes not answered, why are we doing that? Why do we know that that's the right architecture? I know that's the trend. I know that's what all the cool kids are doing, um, but it may not be uh, something that's to our advantage. And so we need to consider that. So given that we're getting these data points out there that are pushing against microservices, we're seeing some trends that are occurring. Uh, companies are asking about the economic considerations. These are not things that cost us a couple of thousand dollars in difference uh, over the months. It can be many hundreds of thousands of dollars that could be saved just by using a different kind of an architecture, moving from microservice-based architecture to a monolithic architecture. So cost efficiency is the primary factor, and that is a huge factor. In other words, people will use a different architecture if there's hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, on the line. And those are resources that businesses could use in other ways. And so why not save the money if you're going to achieve the same end state? You have to remember, we're not trading off the functionality of, of, of the applications. They're functioning the same, at least they should be. But all things being the same, the monolithic architectures are going to be cheaper to run, uh, cheaper to maintain, and much less complex. So the expenses occurred from cloud services and serverless models pushing companies to reconsider. And so we're seeing this a lot of time. I'm in lots of meetings where we're talking about re-engineering, modernizing their systems, you know, that were created with microservices many years ago that are looking to move to a monolithic architecture today. Reducing operational complexity. Um, you're able to, 
um, you know, not have to deal with managing and orchestrating a web of microservices that are interconnected, either via networks. In many instances, we're lo relocating them all over the place. So they were uh, had hundreds of thousands of miles of uh, 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 thousands and thousands of miles of network infrastructure, wide area network in between these services that were being invoked. And so we had these very complex distributed systems. And therefore, it removed operational efficiency, um, you know, when compared to monolithic systems. So considering the performance and scalability there, um, in many cases, I think people were under the impression, probably incorrectly so, that microservices somehow provided additional scalability and resiliency. That wasn't always the case. And so... Um, when you scaled microservices, they normally had certain bottlenecks. Uh, one of the things I noticed in building service-oriented systems, when that's when the, those kinds of systems were all in vogue, you know, back in 2002, 2000 uh, to 2005, that when I was leveraging fine-grained services, the performance was an issue. So, the smaller and more narrowly focused the services, um, the more performance issues that I had, and and, and so that's why I leveraged coarse-grained services, even though. They weren't as architecturally uh, beneficial. Uh, they were able to provide me with much better performance. And so everybody is looking to you know, leverage whatever is going to be the best architect architecture to solve their problems. And I think that's why we came to this today. So now there's a case against microservices. So the pushback on microservices really comes down to some very pragmatic considerations. This is not about what's cool. This is not about what's elegant. Um, this is about what works best, costs least, therefore is able to bring the most value back to the business. And I tell that to my architecture students all the time, that we're not in the business of building what's most what's trendy and following the trends, you know, such as containers and Kubernetes and microservices. Everybody went down that path. That's what we're talking about it. But the ability to find the most efficient architecture that's going to solve the issue. So you're looking at different arguments for microservices and arguments against microservices. And obviously the for microservices stuff is everything we just talked about. In other words, uh, we're uh, looking at different components that are able to uh, be mixed and matched and we are going to have more organizational options and our microservices are going to have some benefits in those kinds of scenarios. If we're leveraging a single narrow service over and over again, I'm able to leverage that service across applications and I'm able to isolate my maintenance domain into a single service or a collection of services that has true architectural advantages. And so there's reasons why you would want to leverage microservices, and that's typically going to be reason to leverage microservices. However, there's reasons that uh, you would not want to uh, leverage microservices. Everything that we just talked about um, typically requires more resources. Uh, they're more complex. They cost more money to run. Uh, that People are going to architect them differently. They're not always going to be... Um, they're not always going to be done and uh, built in the same way. And so people are starting to notice the disadvantages to the point where a lot of this stuff is being brought up in articles and people are truly looking at the trade off. And I think it's a healthy thing. Um, this one size fits all mentality we seem to have in the technological world, whether it's containers, Kubernetes, hybrid, you know, multi cloud deployments, you know, whatever is the coolest uh, architecture of the time, maybe the right selection for you, the right choice for you, but not everybody. And we have to consider the problems we're looking to solve in order to figure out how to bring the best business advantage back to leveraging this technology. That's all we're saying here. I'm not saying you shouldn't use microservices or you shouldn't use microservices. I'm saying that there are issues around using microservices that everybody needs to understand who are looking to leverage them. Cost is an issue. And the ability to utilize uh, cloud resources in more efficient ways is an issue. And so that needs to be put on the table. And I'm trying to put, put it on the table with this video. So let's look at the lessons that we can learn from our experience with microservices over the last 15, 20 years. So we have to continually assess the value of these architectures. We encourage businesses to evaluate the architecture for alignment to operational goals and business goals. I don't think that was being done. I think in many cases microservices were chosen because they were considered the de facto way to do that, uh, industry best practice, what have you. 
And like I said, I was in many meetings where they would lead with that we're going to use microservices when they really didn't understand the problems they're looking to uh, solve. So again, it's adapting to changing technology. We have the onslaught of AI technology, uh, utilization of cloud, heterogeneous computing environments, very complex computing environments. And I think it's okay to question the use of any architecture, including microservices. Industry shifts may be there as well. So there's a growing interest in monolithic designs or hybrid models. I'm seeing lots of articles, and I li listed a few of them in, our, uh, in the comments, on people leveraging microservices that are reporting huge success and huge cost savings. So re-examine the emphasis on microservices in the tech narrative. I think it's going to be something that comes out of this. Um, and those are normally messages that I, and if I started talking about that stuff 20 years ago, was lost on everybody. They, 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 everybody wanted to move in the same directions. And if I was, you know, pointing out the negative uh, issues around microservices, those are typically conversations that they didn't want to have. And I think now people are open to it, which is healthy. I think we're questioning ourselves and the ability to improve the way we build and deploy software on cloud and other systems. So let's recap what we know. Um, microservices viability in the light of cost performance challenges need to be made. And I think, um, you know, even if you're watching this show, I, it doesn't really matter if you're a software engineer or an architect or not. Uh, if you're, you know, someone who's a cloud enthusiast, uh, it's good to know that these are going to be uh, challenges and decisions that need to be made. Never should be a check mark. We never should go uh, toward where everybody else is going. So look at the strategic thinking in terms of architecture and understand what all architecture should know, but often aren't practiced. We need to measure our success and the amount of value that we turn back to the business. It's not the value of the architecture, architectural coolness that we're building and using the latest and greatest technologies, um, microservices, you know, Kubernetes containers, things like that, but the ability to build systems that are gonna be viable for the business. And it's something we have a tendency to forget uh, in the world of development, IT, cloud architecture, things like that. And we shouldn't forget that. So we need to encourage innovation, by the way. I'm not saying that uh, we're innovations bad since, you know, basically people moved into microservices because it was viewed as something that was going to be uh, cool and unique. Uh, what I am saying is that if we are going to innovate, that we ask more questions in the future. What about resource utilization? What about security? What about governance? What about ethical impl implications of this stuff. All that stuff needs to be on the table. So we're urging enterprises to review their architecture choices that they're making, ones they've made in the past, and moving forward, making sure that they're always asking the questions that need to be asked, because I don't think those questions are coming up uh, in many instances. And that's what's going to get a lot of enterprises in trouble. I think a lot of the pushback on cloud computing now is the fact that it's costing the enterprise is way too much money, as I wrote about in my book, typically 2.5 times what um, what enterprises are used to, uh, thought they were going to see. And the reason that those are occurring, because I think we've architected and migrated our applications and built applications in ways that were wholly under-optimized. In other words, they, they weren't necessarily optimized for the business. And I think that won't sustain ourselves moving forward. We have to start being a little bit more critical in terms of how we're leveraging technology or else we're going to end just repeating the same mistakes. We're seeing the movement to AI. I see lots of many of the same mistakes being made because people aren't looking at the efficiencies of the technology and the architectural choices that they're making. They're just following crowds. And if you do that, you're going to make some bad choices. Well, that's all I have for this week. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, don't forget to check out my InfoWorld blog. Check out my courses out on LinkedIn Learning. Check out my uh, generative uh, AI architecture course out on Go Cloud Careers. Uh, check me out on LinkedIn. Check me out on X. Check out my book, An Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing. Still doing well. Love to get your feedback there. So until next time, be safe, and I'll talk to you next week. Cheers.